This is Today's Business Leaders, actionable advice from real-world professionals. And now, here's your host, Gabe Arnold. All right. Today on the show, I have David Wolf, who is a longtime friend of mine. Um, so this is a great honor, and he is an expert in all things radio and podcast and many other things. Um, so welcome to the show, David. Thanks, Gabe. Great to be with you. Awesome. So as we always start, um, and this will be pretty interesting because I don't even know if we've had this conversation fully like this. Good. I always, Good. I always ask. After two, three years for yeah. a, however long it's been. Yeah. <laughs> I know, quite a while now. Um, what, when did you first realize you're an entrepreneur? Okay. I had a, a moment when I was a child, probably about six or eight years old, where my brother and I were playing in the backyard in Skokie, Illinois. I grew up in the north side of Chicago. And uh, I, I took a, it was like a, um, a suitcase and stood it on its uh, end so that there was like the, the, the door would be like a gate. Uh -huh. and, and my brother, my little brother was on a tricycle and I was pretending to collect toll from him as he would run through on the narrow sidewalk of our backyard, you know, these old Georgian houses in uh -huh. Chicago. And there was something about the sense of transactions going by as he would do this and I would play that, uh, that, that it was like a guttural, almost like visceral experience of pleasure. Like dopamine was flying because I, of transactions. Now, it turned out that years, years later, when I was 40 years old, uh, after a whole 20 or 25 year career as a creative professional, mm -hmm. first as a musician and then ultimately as a um, composer for radio, TV, and film, I. Um, I took on a, uh, a turnaround project with a family business. It was about a $3 million business when I took it over. And I, I decided to just park my creative stuff. And the business was diminishing. Let's not, I'm not going to, I'm going to be very transparent. I, I didn't, I, I, I hit one of those places in life where it was like, it was like the gap between things I was doing. And I didn't really know where this was going, but I had some capital <clears throat> and I lunged into this, um, this project and ran it for about eight years. And coming out the other end of that, was when I started Small Biz America, my own podcast. And it was the, the coupling of having gone through this really, really incredibly challenging learning curve with family members in a business uh, that ultimately really didn't turn out so good. Uh, mm -hmm. From a financial perspective, the business ran for eight or nine years under my watch, but I learned a lot, but it, it, it didn't, there was no exit that was useful to anybody. Yeah. But, um, but it was the coming out of that that I realized, wow, this work is really hard. I participated in this thing called entrepreneurship in a way that I, I really didn't uh, completely understand yet. But as I launched into Small Biz America and started to talk to a lot of people that do small business, that was when I defined that, oh, this is the experience I had gone through. So, Pretty cool. What, um, <clears throat> what was this? Is this the bakery? Is that the was yeah, it was a company called Wolf's Bagels. They spelled the name differently. It was with an E because graphically that looked better. And, uh, <laughs> and it was a cousin of mine who built the business. This was a tremendous family business story. We had, you know, uh, the brother-in-law was in for, uh, you know, several hundred thousand. My parents were in for 30 or 40,000. And, you know, I was in, still in the music business wanting to invest because I really thought the cousin had it going on. And, mm -hmm. uh, and he did. He, is, he and his wife deployed a tremendously successful ethnically Jewish, you know, bakery uh, cafe. It was um, a bagel store, but with all the Jewish, you know, uh, European, you know, it was uh, the knishes and the, uh, uh, the chopped liver and, you know, the whole counter full of it was a traditional like deli. Nice. And then they moved into wholesale and they didn't get too far into wholesale before he blew it up. What he did was he, he grew too fast. I mean, we've, you've covered this, I'm sure, on your show and yeah. really talked about it. But it was a retail, you know, brick and mortar operation. There was nothing online then. This was 89 when they launched. And they, he was a, a banker and she was uh, consulting for Einstein's and uh, in, uh, on, uh, um, Einstein's and um, Noah, Noah's Bagels. They merged. And as after that happened, she said, you know, 
she looked at her husband, my cousin, and said, we can do this. Well, let's pick a market. They picked Albuquerque, New Mexico, where I now live, <coughs> excuse me, and, mm. and deployed out of one store, and it just exploded. There was a lot of demand because Albuquerque had about 650,000 people at the time, and there was enough of a sort of a base of Jewish population in the market to support, you know, the bagel, with, you know, and then on from the Jewish core, but, you know. And, um, and so, but then they started to get, let's open another one, let's open another one, let's do another one. And then they also invested capital in redundant resources, like they had a bakery. These operations are, you know, some complexity to it. You've got a mixed dough and bake mm -hmm. and there's a lot of equipment involved and a lot of stuff. So, but they duplicated that on the east and west side of town and they were just pouring capital into the, you know, maybe uh, redundant ways, uh, in redundant ways and uh, ultimately went into bankruptcy in um, 2000, no, in uh, 89, uh, sorry, 90, somewhere around 90. Uh, or 89, yeah, they, they started it early, earlier than that. I ran a few years and then went into bankruptcy. And then I came in uh, right around uh, 2000. Oh, that was right, 90, 90 uh, well, anyway, I think it was about 98 it went into bankruptcy. Sorry, I had a brain freeze. And, um, and then I came in 2000 with some amount of capital, actually worked with the bankruptcy court and bought the assets out of bankruptcy, negotiated with a lease uh, with, the, uh, um, uh, with the landlords, so they were wow. building. They also overbuilt, you know, they overbuilt the building and they left the landlord holding the bag as they went into bankruptcy. It was really an, an interesting process, let me say that. And I don't want to go too deep on the bagels. We'll end up in the hole of the bagel. But, uh, <laughs> but, it, but it, it was profoundly um, useful in terms of uh, understanding how hard it is to do small business or any business. It is hard. Uh... And I, we, we, we've never gone into that much depth before. Like I knew that was, it was like the bakery and that was the extent of what we talked about before. But I, it's pretty interesting that you share like that you negotiated with the bankruptcy court and like you bought all the stuff and you did the turnaround thing because I did that um, in 08 with the repossession company. Oh, wow. Leading money and falling apart. And I came in and like hired, you know, new general managers and like did the whole thing. And it's, it's pretty interesting to, and I had just come out of my own business crashing. So I was, you know, yeah. this mean, is the, uh, I, was a construction related, right? Yeah. When I, yeah. when I lost the construction company, this was like one of the, one of the three jobs I did in between. Um, How and, old were you when that happened? I know, I know you, it's a conversation, but like, you're yeah, like 12, 24, 25. Wow. You were really young. Yeah. yeah. So, That's about the time I started my music company, the very first business I had. I didn't, I didn't think of it as entrepreneurship because I was just writing music in a studio <laughs> and producing it. And my wife was really more running the front office, which was the business part. And I really stayed out of that. Yeah. <clears throat> anyway, yeah. So, so, you, so you've been through this uh, kind of an arc with, uh, yeah. And it's, it's pretty interesting to come into a business and in, in their like highest point of pain and then see if it can be solved. And then also like you're pretty, even, even like, I mean, years later, obviously you're pretty aware of like redundant resources and like mismanagement of capital and things like that. And I um, kind of where I'm going with it is we've talked before too about one of the guests you've had on your show, Michael Gerber, who wrote the E-Myth. And right. I'm assuming you've read that a couple of times. Um, right. right. I've definitely and, did a deep skim if not read it. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> I've been reading Michael's stuff for a bit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's so amazing work. Did you have any of that knowledge in hand when you went to do that turnaround or, or, did, or now looking back, do you like, Oh, that's why nothing worked. Well, it's a great, it's a great question because actually before we, I walked away from it in uh, 2008, 2007, just around the crash. Yeah. I want to say a couple of things. Let me set the stage. So, so it was, a, it was a retail chain of stores, when I got there, but it wasn't a chain anymore. There was one location that co-located with the commissary where all the bagel, they had the bagel production operation was made. So my brother and I made a fundamental decision. We weren't going to try to duplicate multiple retail because that didn't work. And there was a, a, a period where a, a major brand came in and wanted to buy all of the existing locations long before I got there. And, mm -hmm. and my cousin refused to sell to them. So he held out. It was an, it was a clear exit. Everyone would have been whole, 
you know, in other words, he, he went with the ego decision, which was no way we're not doing that because we're <laughs> wolf spangles. And, you know, so this is my narrative. I, I think it's fairly accurate, but yeah. And, and without blame or shame or any of that, I just think that, uh, you know, this is hard to do and I don't blame anybody for the failure of their business or even for the subsequent uh, failures we went through. So the e-myth and the idea with the e-myth, as many of you know, as you listen to this uh, live or otherwise, is, is that people run systems and systems run the business and it is the systems that enable you to scale. Yeah. And you can pull back and work on the business rather than in the tactical nature of the business. So, um, so the way that folds into what we were doing is about 2005, there was a consult. This is before I knew Michael. There was a consultant here that was one of his licensees that had the book of the e myth and was consulting, and I paid him to come in and help me. Nice. So I actually created, I had a general manager. I wasn't, you know, I'm not a bakery guy. I'm a marketing. I learned how to read financial statements. I raised a million plus from a high net worth guy that we knew through, the, through connections uh, up in Santa Fe. Um, he was very enthusiastic about the brand. It was beautiful setup. And by the way, he's a brilliant guy that was running a $30 billion uh, mortgage portfolio. Wow. Uh, but this was before the crash. So, you know, right. in 08, so, you know, he had his hands full, uh, as I was beginning to contemplate walking away. Um, but what we decided is we, we went into it with a wholesale, uh, emphasis rather than a retail emphasis, uh, initially. And we knew that we, you know, we knew that we wanted to do that, but but um, we still had too much capacity and not enough market to absorb it. So I found myself going into Texas and going into peripheral markets. We eventually did uh, sell to Whole Foods, uh, Wild Oats before, and you know, concomitantly. So we were in major chains, and then we were in the local guys too. So we had a good wholesale business, but the margins are very small in bakery goods, and you have you are dealing with perishables and. Uh, so there's a lot of sort of interdynamics about the, the life of the product. And, and, but Michael, you asked about Michael Gerber's work and, and the idea that systems. So I did make an attempt to create systems and a more systematic approach to running the business. Mm -hmm. But I think there were some fundamental problems with the business model wholesale in this market where I, I just couldn't scale it enough to, because if I lost one large account, Whole Foods, let's say, if I'm in eight or nine stores and I lose mm -hmm. that account, because they, you know, summarily decided to take it in house, which they tended their pendulum kind of swings on bakery, and um, and and as well as we had, you know, this sort of lightning of interest around anything with gluten during that period, right? Where right. when the business was really accepted, way. it was yeah. a health food. Now it, it was a natural food. Oh, yeah, let's go. But there's a lot of sugar and a lot of yeast, and uh, I'm sorry, a lot of um, gluten in the in that mixture for bakery. Right. Uh, it's 14 percent gluten. It's, you know, it's loaded with gluten. And so we had a lot of, we had some headwinds. Anyway, I, I, you may want to go other places on this segment, but uh, I hope I, I answered your question about systems and, and my attempt to apply them. Yeah, no, I, I'm just curious. It's, there's no, we, I have no direction. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's good because I'm a jazz musician. Fundamentally, that's who I am. And so uh, I like the nonlinear thing. You know? Yeah. Cool. I didn't know that either. See, this is always fun. I actually get to get out with people, even though I've known you for years. <laughs> That's funny. Well, our, our, you know, we've been, it's a different application of the funnel concept. We've been very focused on what we do. I, yeah. played, uh, I played jazz in Chicago initially, Dixieland Jazz at a, um, an amusement park called uh, Great America. It was a Marriott property up in Gurney, Illinois. And that's really where I learned how to play. And it's interesting because there are, um, do you mind if I? Yeah, I would love to learn more about it. So, so there's analogies, you know, business analogies kind of, fly, they do a lot of, you know, they show up in a lot of weird places. So, you know, improvised music, spontaneously working with a team, a tuba player, a drummer, that was me, a banjo player, uh, we had trombone, clarinet, and trumpet. And, um, you know, you, you're playing uh, forms of you know Dixieland is beautiful because you, there's a form to the to the to the music uh, that's repeated and we solo we play the what we call the head or the melody and then we jam on it and then we play the head out so it's a very symmetrical kind of uh, thing traditional jazz and um, when you have to spontaneously interact with many people and as drummer being the glue I think that analogy sort of carried with me into the business world uh, in a way because uh, 
I, I, ultimately I was producing in the studio where I had a, a little bit more control of the situation because I was delivering a product to an advertising client or a filmmaking client or whoever. But I, um, but I think there's, there's a lot of these sort of metaphorical things uh, about business and creative um, that, that could be interesting. And probably there's a book somewhere that you and I can co write. So. <laughs> we should write that book. That's really interesting. I, <clears throat> I love jazz. I don't, I'm not like, I don't listen to it enough, but I do like it for the creative end of like, it's like a system for creativity. It's exactly it. Which it's is totally, that's beautiful actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cause you've got chords and changes. And, yeah. yeah. And it's like, but you, you said something interesting too, like the drummers, the glue that holds it all together. So in business it's, it's like what systems, what process do we have in place? And then the rest right. of it can kind of ride on top of that. You lose that and everything can kind of fall apart on you. <laughs> Or you're off. You're off. Yeah. Or if you or if you rush or drag. I mean, if you're a drummer that rushes or drags, it drags the whole business down. So as the CEO, let's call it the CEO or the COO. You've got to be understanding um, what's the tempo that's appropriate to grow this thing. There's actually, you know, that that you just unlock some stuff. Um, that, that's actually quite profound because it's the human mind creating, whether we're creating a business or we're creating a, a, our next solo on a tune or yeah. whatever. So that's, that's very uh, prophetic. I think we just found our next book we'll co-author together. Absolutely. We'll do it. In all our spare time. Um. Yeah, exactly. That's another book. <laughs> we'll write a book about the book we couldn't write because we didn't have enough spare time to write the book. It's pure, 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 a week's not having caffeine and then, just, yeah, You're no. back on. <laughs> Watch yeah, out, everybody. Hey, I, I better. I'm back off for the rest of the week. I'll be scary. Yeah. No. That's. I. No. I think it's. I think it's good. And it's like um, something I've been learning a ton about and still trying to figure out is like yeah. Yeah. being the CEO, creative visionary. Like that's you and I are both on that page a lot. Like we're always coming up with ideas and trying stuff. Which I don't know if that's like the solo was the guitar solo or whatever. And then COO is definitely drummer because like you've got to operationally figure out what, what to do with all your creative ideas. And, and in the beginning you are CEO, COO, technician, everything. Yes. Yes. You're the, yeah. And then another sort of Gerber moment, right? Where yeah, you're the, yeah. you're the uh, technician in the business rather than the owner of it. And the way, and this is a normal description because this is the way everybody describes it, the way that you describe like how the bagel thing happened it is that they had a tech, an entrepreneurial seizure, as Michael would say, and they're like, oh, I know how to make bagels. I should own a bagel company. <laughs> right. That's, that's, that's exactly the origin of, of the seat. The seizure starts, sets up the, 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 there's two paths you could take with the seizure. You know, there's yeah. one, you know. And, um. That was definitely my experience with early businesses is like always just like, oh, I know how to do that. I should just go do it. And then by the tail end of having that seizure, I actually knew a little bit about business. And then my second iteration was still a little bit of a seizure. But then like my third or fourth or fifth or 10th iterations, I actually don't have to have a seizure to do it. I can, and you know this, we talk about this a lot now. Yeah, but for the benefit of the audience though, this is great. Yeah, so we end up, um, now it's like, if I want to do something, I actually build the system first, or I know what the system's going to look like. Right. And, right. and then I test, and we've tested and played with multiple different things over the years. Right. Which is good for, our, you know, entrepreneurial creativity. But like, if we start with the right model, things tend to work pretty well. If we just start purely out and way out in the creative zone, sometimes it's hard to pull it back into a structured system and model. And it, it may or may not work. It can, but it's like there's some speed bumps to get there, I think. Absolutely. And just to touch on the musical metaphor, I would say that the experimenting or the, the testing of new things in a marketplace, uh, defined marketplace is analogous to, let's say, a trumpet player. Suddenly he's playing inside the chord. And those of you who are musicians may understand this. And then he'll wander out and then come back, going outside the changes, as we say in the music business. Um, in business, that's somewhat analogous to what you described, where you've got an idea, it's the seizure. Within, maybe it's within the context of copywriter today, or you've right. got a, you know, your infrastructure of business, and, mm -hmm. uh, and, and you have to test it and proof of concept with it. And I'm just starting to learn from watching you, and uh, we've talked, you've coached me 
on um, on how to control that a little bit better. I think you've given me some some advice along the way that's been very useful. Yeah, thank you. There's like a certain level of dissonance that we can all handle. Ha, and and uh, if you stay inside that, like you just said, like you can travel outside the cord, you right. can bend that note up to a certain point, but there is a breaking point and there is an annoyance point. point. Right, and then the audience or the market, and the audience is analogous to your market in that illustration, I think, and, and if the audience just doesn't get it or hear it or it's too far out, yeah. just, then it just connects. Yeah. Yeah, it's not going to connect. It's not going to land. I like the word land. Yeah, and I and you and you. I'm sure you know this, but like I was doing some research on this and was reading a book about how um, hits are made, like how pop hits are made. Oh yeah, yeah. And you may know this story, um, but I'll tell it anyway. No, I mean I don't think I do. The um, Outcast put out a song called "Hey Ya." Remember that? Okay. Yeah. It went. It went. It went huge, and it was all. It was a forced hit because there's a, there's a data company in the UK and this is like 20 years ago now, or I, don't, I mean, or right. 10 years ago, at least it, a long time ago when it came out, I remember, but right. there was a company in the UK that said, we know this is going to hit. We guarantee you that it's going to hit. So they ran it a little bit and people were like, I hate this song. It's stupid. And then, but like everybody bet on this song. There was a, there was millions put into it. Everybody had bet on it and they're like, okay, if we're going to make it work, we need to change the psychology around the, around the thought process and conversations that's happening with the song. So they said, here's what you have to do. And they, and you're a radio guy and you may know about some of these things. They're like, we're going to sandwich that song between two hits that are already number one and number two and have been for a couple of years. So they, in their playlist, they played the first song, which I can't remember the name of it. Then they played Hey Ya, and then they played the second song. They kept doing that, like so many repetitions, and it actually changed the psychology of our culture because we had a positive emotion going into something that we didn't like. And then we had a positive emotion, emotion on the other side, and we reshaped our feeling about something that overall people didn't like. But then it turned into a giant hit because we act, they actually forced the marketplace. That's fascinating. I'm going to name that the emotional sandwich play. There you go. Right? Because um, yeah, it's I love just it. like, how could you? It's sort of like the, if you get them to say yes, and then they're, or um, yeah, if there's a yes, a follow of a yes is easier. Do I have that right? Yep, like that's that. the consistency role. That's yep. sales psychology, right? Yeah. yeah. And so I don't know where I'm going, but we're going there. But no, um, no, it feels good. Um, this, is, this is helpful. But um, so like knowing that as we think about like business and like putting it together. Right. Um, and, I, and I'm a very amateur musician. I, you know, I couldn't keep up with you. I'm sure I, I, I can hardly read music and I can hardly play. But um, if I pulled out my guitar yeah. with my guitar teacher who's been playing for his entire life, I think, and right. he's my business mentor. It's a lifestyle thing, yeah. No, I, I could pull out and just whip out a few notes and act like I know how to play. Right. And I don't know where in the sphere of sound I would be, but he's so experienced and so right. good that right. he could come in and make me sound good. So, like, we talk about, right. like, jazz ensemble. You could start out on your own doing something crazy and a really adept drummer and another musician and everybody could start to sink into what you're doing and they could actually suck you back into their system. Right. And, right. and the right, the right coach or consultant or partner or vendor or whoever, if you're just starting out in, in business or you're just starting out in a new area, if you know they can actually play that they're actually a virtuoso in business, then that's somebody that can just quickly fix your situation mm -hmm. and make you sound good and you'll learn a ton from them. And Absolutely. I didn't know that's what we were going to talk about today, but that's what came yeah, out. Yeah, it's very similar. No, these <laughs> analogies are beautiful. Yeah. Um, another analogy that I like to use, I was very involved with flying airplanes between mm -hmm. the age of like 29 and uh, 40. And uh, the flying of an airplane, you know, it's sort of one of those things. It's like music. It's a little... Uh, you know, it's mysterious in some level. In our form. The whole fact that they can fly and, you know, this, you know, but, but the, 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 um, the, the tactical, uh, well, everything, the planning, you know, the flight planning, you have to get from point A to B, but you don't quite know how you're going to do it. There's a, you know, sort of a category, the macro flight plan, right. the weather that may change and you have to what's called track and bracket to, to, in other words, you know, airplanes don't fly straight with the nose pointing where they're going to go. They have to adjust for the wind. So they're doing this. 
right? So sometimes in business, you know, you, you have to tweak it three degrees o- o- overs, and then, but you're still going to that same airport. It you, may not look like it. <laughs> right. Then there's the concept of alternate because you have to have enough fuel to fly to your original destination plus 45 minutes, says the FAA, right? So you have to plan for reserve. So that's like capital reserve, your fuel in the tank. I mean, there's, it's a whole nother book, you know? Um, yeah. It goes beyond. I don't know. There's something here. This is cool. Bagels uh, and beyond. Bagels, j- jazz, and airplanes. <laughs> uh, yeah. Maybe. Maybe that's that simple. I don't know. You know, I, I work with a lot of authors these days. And um, what's interesting is that as I encounter each of them, they each have their own. It's largely metaphorical or it's biographical with metaphor or it's narrative. These are business books by and large. They're not fiction. Uh, most mm-hmm. of the audiobooks we produce are, are you know, self-help or they're um, business, you know, consulting, coaching, sort of in there. Yeah. yeah. And everybody's got their own sort of way in the door and, uh, and hoping to connect with an audience that relates to it. So that's key to all of that. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. <laughs> wow, well, I was right. I, I really enjoy our conversation. This is great. I'm, yeah, I'm glad we get yeah. to share this with everybody because we always go off on these trips and <laughs> nobody can really ever listen. But, um, but uh, yeah, you point out something else too. And like, I, I think we'll, I'll wrap up some of the analogies, but you said like when you're flying, you're not pointing straight at where you're going. You're going at kind of an angle and you're drifting there. Yeah. And I, I've heard a pattern. I actually did a live about this within the last few weeks. I've heard a pattern from the business crates that there are no straight lines in business. It's always like a diagonal direction or it's all, always the angle that you come in or it's the way that you figure it out. Wow. And that's just really interesting too. But um, so take us from, the bagel experience where you learned a lot. And like, I think that's probably invaluable experience. I mean, that's just like, you raised a million bucks. I don't know a lot of people that can say that you went in and tried to turn around a company, learned a ton. You saw what worked, didn't work. I mean, you just had, that was your business MBA probably. Or the yeah. Cause I'm not formally trained. Even musically, I studied with a bunch of private teachers and learned film scoring and orchestration and all that stuff. But yeah. I'm not a guy that sat in class and got a degree. Yeah. You're not economic and neither am I. I'm equally (laughs) not terminally, I'm terminally unemployable as well. Although I've had, I've had uh, shades of, of periods where I was quasi employed. I was like a 1099 employee. Yeah. And, um, but an an imposter, I was an imposter. So you go through that, which is your MBA, and then take us from there to where you are today with like what you do through Small Business America. Uh, Yeah. all that good stuff and, yeah. and and how we met i'd be curious to hear your perspective of how we met so all, all that. i can't remember how we met i'm having a memory lapse you might remember better because you're a few years younger but anyway the uh so the bagel thing crashes um my partner can't put any more capital in i'm i'm dry and um you know i walked away and i actually conveyed it uh to there's a long sort of internal story that i don't want to bar more people with but it was it was a, a um, it was a trying time not only because of the financial you know sort of mess it wasn't mess it was clearly not working so I had to end it right the punctuation was a, a huge decision by Whole Foods to, that which I alluded to earlier they were a huge part of the the, the wholesale uh, array of business we had we were selling Cisco and Shamrock and a bunch of frozen yeah. But, you know, and it was a night, you know, you look at that, it was, you know, this was an interesting, yeah, that ought to work, but I think our, we were just spending too much to do it. So, um, I took a bankruptcy and coming out of that, I mean, this is, you can imagine the emotional, you know, we've got two families with the husbands and wives. My brother took, he actually departed before I walked away and went to Denver and started a similar company with another partner. That's what, wow. yeah, that was a weird, and we're still talking. So you talk about fundamentals and family values, but yeah, no kidding. <laughs> but uh, I, I understood that he needed to do that for himself. You know, he's my younger brother, and this is just something he needed to do for whatever the reasons were. And I understood it, and and so as it as it wound down, I had started podcasting. This was oh well, oh uh, seven. I had started podcasting before I uh, this ended. So oh six, say oh seven, we close, and. The Small Biz America talking to business owners, and I had a, a feature, and you know, I was reapplying um, what I knew about audio production and what I now knew about 
the, the plight of the small business owner in the world yeah. and mm-hmm. converge those two things without really having a clue about where I was going. But I opened up the mic and I started talking to businesses everywhere. I locally, I would go out and with a microphone and hold it up and ask him questions. And I really had no clue, but I was fairly lost. This was a period, it was a difficult period, as you can imagine. Mm-hmm. At that point, I was about 47 years old. And, um, and so ultimately, I, I, about a year and a half ago, just to kind of rush to the, the conclusion of that, I, I came back home and I made a series of, I decided to decide that I needed to go back to uh, what I know and I have credibility in, which is the, broadly speaking, the audio production world, mm-hmm. and apply it. Again, I merged it with this business knowledge or this business curiosity that I developed through not only starting and crashing and burning a uh, small business, but also um, talking to a lot of smart people in the process of inter- interviewing them. Yeah. So, um, and gradually, this entrepreneurial thing started, and we've been talking about this, to a world where I've got now three clear business um, units, if you want to call them that. It's still on a solopreneur with a couple of outsources, so it's not developed into a large infrastructure, but, and it may not ever. I'm still contemplating how big and how I, how I want to grow, but I do three things now, or we, you know, the we, which is me, uh, the extension of me. Um, we produce podcasts for business leaders and uh, thought leaders and authors and speakers that want to get their message out. So we do the production back end, recording, editing, production, distribution. Uh, we produce audiobooks, same kind of turnkey operation. We mm-hmm. <clears throat> record authors or narrators and prepare it for Audible and other distribution on the online uh, downloadable audiobooks, which has been growing, by the way, at 29% year over year for the last three years. So that's a huge market. Right? That's crazy. Yeah, I know, it's really <clears throat> more than ebooks, at least according to Edison. I believe it's Edison Research. E- uh, no, it's e good reader. Uh, they reported that uh, ebooks are declining by 15% year over year, a current sort of a rolling year basis. So wow. you, know, you got those dynamics going on. This is interesting. And I'm seeing it because I'm getting a lot of calls for audiobook production uh, from, from direct from authors, from a handful of publishers that I work with now, and I'm still developing those relationships. And then the third thing we do is this uh, radio model. The internet radio is fascinating to me because it's there's 180 million people, according to Edison, listening to the lean back audio streaming type of thing where you, where you press it, press the button, and like you do in your car, whatever's playing is playing. Right. Um, so I've created a rotational play um, model where, where we charge uh, and offer to podcasters the ability to augment their RSS distribution you know, mm-hmm. iTunes and Stitcher and Spotify and all those guys, which is very, I mean, that's where most of the market lives. If you're a podcaster, you, that's how you distribute. And I'm saying, look, let's, I'm creating niche radio stations that are sort of curated and I charge a small um, subscription fee for them to have additional distribution. And so I say the way I position it is it augments your existing distribution uh, by joining one of our niche targeted radio stations. So those are the three things I'm doing today. And it's a new expression of sort of entrepreneurship meets audio production. So, yeah, no, that's, very, that's very cool. <clears throat> and you mentioned um, a couple other things that kind of come to mind too. You go through this very painful period, which I know exactly what that's like. It's, it is super painful. Yeah. Um, and it's, I mean, it's good to hear that you were able to give your little brother the space to go do whatever he needed to do because family and business is super hard. But I think that yeah. the depth of character and like the people that I enjoy working with the most have faced that level of adversity because like you have a high level of empathy. Um, And I think that that's a key to be successful in life is like, you can't, you can't just rush around and not realize what else is going on, like what other people are experiencing or what it's like to fail at, at that level. And I, and even though it was super hard, I'm really thankful that I just blew out and failed in my mid twenties, like bad, like if you experienced that in your forties and I can't imagine, I can't imagine going another 10 years and experiencing that and how to recover from that. Just, I think that'd be hard. (laughs) Yeah. I don't even know what's driving me now. I had a friend of mine who told me I was resilient. This is a guy who's, you know, in his mid seventies now writing novels in in Puerto Vallarta. So, and he's been through a, a stream of stuff he sold a business for, uh, north of a million dollars years ago was in the pet, uh, the, the clothing for pet. Uh, it was called Poochie was the name of the company. 
<laughs> he's a Madison Avenue. Yeah, he's a Madison Avenue copywriter, creative director, and went into business with his wife, and they created this company, and it was hugely successful. But we have something in common similar to this. It unraveled because they were in a business they really weren't designed. They didn't understand you know, how to buy right from China and how to put the materials together. I mean, it was a very similar kind of experience where the idea was brilliant, but they didn't have the capacity to really um, execute efficiently and, uh, and measure. You know, one thing that really came out of all of that whole period was, and it's back to the metaphor, uh, is the, the risk, you know, the, it's easy to underestimate the risk of an idea. Yeah. I mean. And then and, and it's, this, it's this tension between the risk and the opportunity that it's in, it's the way the financial markets work. It's the way we trade. It's the way, you know, it's all of it. And uh, that's, that's humanity and business, I guess. Yeah, it sure is. There's, there's so much to learn from it. And the, what I, what I've enjoyed about working with you, cause I think we met, a while ago, three or four years ago now, I, yeah. I reached out to you on LinkedIn because you were in some affiliate group. And I said, hey, you want an affiliate for my products? That's how we met. Is that how we met? And I liked the affiliate idea, <clears throat> and, I, and I still do. Um, I've sort of walked, I moved away from it mentally because I'm one guy, and if I had a team of people, somebody would say, you know, we ought to do an affiliate thing with this. Yeah. But, uh, but I, um, but, uh, I, that appealed to me. I, I like the idea of leveraging. It's like the share economy. You know, that's what right. affiliate model is. And you're really good at deploying and creating systems for email marketing and automating that. Automate, automation is, is beautiful. I love that stuff. Yeah. Uh, I want to implement more of that. I just, it takes, you know, it takes either knowledge or capital or some combination of the two. Yeah. But yeah, there's, and I, it's it's interesting the stats you share about audio that makes perfect sense to me because we have more we have more noise and like in life and it's our ability to sit down and focus and read a page is a little bit harder. Whereas audio, we can dual dual uh, we can do two multitask. things. Yeah, we can multitask and like be listening. Like I I listen to all my books while I'm driving because like driving is boring to me, so I listen to books. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, and, I think that's going on. We're, we're struggling with the scarcity of attention. You know, the right. people want to consume, but they don't have the, enough hours in the day. And um, we're, I think we're all working harder, particularly the middle, whatever the middle class is in America. And we're all right. feeling kind of the, the bottom drop out because of the, the buying, uh, you know, the dollar and all of that. Yeah. You know, the macroeconomic situation we find ourselves in. Um, particularly with healthcare, you know, one thing that I'll mention, how are we doing on time for you? Yeah, we're, we're fine. All right. So, so I heard this, you ever listen to Reed Hoffman's uh, masters of scale? You told me about that the other day. I still have to read it. I, I like, I've read some of his stuff, but I need to follow. Well, this, is a, this is actually a podcast series. So we're talking about listening. So you could listen while you're driving. So I haven't listened to the whole array, but I happen to fall upon one that was about, first of all, I love the production and I want my podcast clients to move into a direction. You know, he's got a team of six people. So, but I'd like to move into a direction where we have a, a more, more of an, uh, an engaging narrative rather than just, you know, intro, interview, outro. You know, this is right. Of, it's, speaking of sandwich, it's the podcast sandwich. So, <laughs> I, you know, and so he's in and out and he's commenting and then there's a sound bite. Anyway, he interviewed Howard Schultz, now leaving Starbucks, but he's the guy that, you know, was responsible. And the clarity of his thinking and the way he speaks was so impressive. But what he said, too, he said that all business owners should build and bake in a, bake in, a, uh, an, uh, a philanthropic social good element to their business, even from the start when there's maybe no revenue or very little revenue, which is, yeah. you know, uh, I mean, I'm starting, I see revenue. But uh, so for this, what I decided to do coming out of that, listening to that interview with Howard Schultz is uh, find a uh, nonprofit that I like and uh, decide to donate a percent. In our case, we're donating 2% to wipe out medical debt across America. Uh, and this, uh, I'll mention the, uh, the organization. I just met with them in New York City about two weeks ago. I met with the co-founder, Jerry Ashton, and they've wiped out more than $160 million worth of families' uh, medical debt. And I just thought that was a profoundly uh, beautiful cause. So um, I didn't have to, you know, there's no signing up. I just had to decide, you know, and now every month I send in the equivalent or above 2% of the revenues on my Grow Your Podcast, which is this internet radio model I mentioned a few minutes ago. So 
So um, that's something that I, I it's worthy of sharing, I guess. It's, it's a little off topic from where we were headed, but maybe it's a no. new song I'm playing now. <laughs> no, that's exactly what it is. And it's really, really cool because um, I know a little bit about collection because that's the turnaround that I did with the repo company. Oh. And you oh. told me what really was really interesting to that uh, when you mentioned this, I'm glad you brought it up. Um, then what's the name of the organization again? RIP medical debt.org. Okay. Um, so the cool thing about collections is by the time it gets down to like this eighth or 10th or 20th collection agency that buys it. Yeah. It's a game of margins. So like right. if originally I, I owed you a hundred bucks, David, and you sent me to collections, by the time I paid that, I would probably pay five bucks. <laughs> right. Because right. It's and that's a, a high number in their world. They're paying right. a penny on the dollar. Can yeah. Imagine? It's a bet. So it's a bet. That's right. Um, Fascinating. How many, I'm going to buy a hundred debt accounts. How many can I get to pay? How good am I, am I yeah. emotionally connecting with you and telling you you should pay me because you owe this right. money? Right. And this is the business these guys were in in the medical. So they were literally calling or one of the partners was calling people that were suicidal, broke, uh, bankrupt and, and ill, seriously yeah. ill and really unemployable mm. with no insurance, whatever. Mm -hmm. And that's who they're trying to collect from. So they turned it around and said, no, let's take the same leverage buying, you know, pennies on the dollar or a penny on the dollar. And let's go raise capital from philanthropic, uh, you know, uh, corporations and companies businesses. And, yeah. Yeah, businesses, uh, that want to help solve this problem. And uh, there were a couple of media pops, one from uh, John Oliver two years ago. They put him on the map. Right. Lester Holt just did, did a uh, piece on it about three weeks ago on the nightly news. And, you know, it's exploding. And a lot of people want to, uh, it's resonating. Because, yeah. this, I mean, the cost of health care, and we could talk about that whole thing. But but at least we're we're working on the, the, the end we're of the equation. The which pain is, of it. Yeah. And, and, and what's so cool is like all nonprofits that this has been a trend going on for over 10 or 15 years. Now, if you want to stay in business, quote unquote business as a nonprofit, you have to become completely entrepreneurial. Now it's not like it was, you know, in oh. your past. And okay. what I, that's what I, that's what really connected with me about the story is they were creative and innovative and they solved the problem in a better way and made right. the world a better place. Instead of like you said, what they were doing before, they realized they were wrong and they made a total turnaround because they were trying to collect from people that are dying. Like that's unfair. <laughs> it was really brutal. And just, and the pain, the way uh, the partner, I can't remember the co-founder, but there was Lester interviewed him and, that's mm -hmm. the, and, and he said, and, and Lester's question was something like, what does, how did you decide to do this? And he said, well, I couldn't get, I got to a point where I couldn't get up in the morning. It was so yeah. painful to talk to these people. Now I can't wait to get up in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> So. That's, and that's just so amazing. And the cool thing about being an entrepreneur, and you know this, and we talked about this before, is like, you don't have to have a billion dollar piece of technology. You don't have to go raise a million bucks because that sometimes works, sometimes it doesn't. Right. All you have to do is find the real problem in the marketplace and serve those people at a higher level. That's right. all. Right. I know it sounds so simple when you say it like that. <laughs> Yet if we're creative and we have ideas, we have these entrepreneurial seizures. Oh, there's a problem. And I know you and I have this in common, maybe to an extent. Yeah. Um, you know, there's this tension between the, what's in your side, your creative bubble and where the market is and meeting the market, you know, like right. In my radio model. Well, I've got a handful of people paying me to be on, on the radio and it's a two sided market. I've got to figure out how to attract new podcasters and then deliver on the audience promise that I'm, I'm telling them I'm going to help them grow their audience. I have to figure out how to show them I can do that. And, right. Uh, I'm, and to some extent, I've got, you know, macro um, reporting that's favorable 30, 40,000 listening sessions a month worldwide. That's pretty good. And one of our stations, actually, the aggregates in that zone. Uh, but I've got to be able to show, hey, your show was listened. So I've got some challenges ahead of me in terms of being able to prove that out. But one of the things, and Hoffman uh, reinforces this a lot in his podcast series, it's called Masters of Scale, is that you just got to get it out there. And be sometimes a little messy and not, it can't be perfect. And you know this yeah. from your A-B testing and, and, and also just your business idea testing. It just, you, it's more important to get it out and deploy it and find out what the market is saying about it than to overbuild it. And then and you've been preaching this a lot. Uh, over the years, we have a tendency to want to overbuild because we have this idea about what it should look like, but really the market's going to tell you. So I guess I'm just talking all of this to say there's a dance between the band and the audience. That's right. You have to see what works. No matter how much you like the concept, that doesn't mean it's going to fly. 
doesn't mean it's going to land. And uh, comedians, same thing. They get it in front of an audience. You know, Jerry Seinfeld, I heard him uh, recently on a, uh, it was actually a, uh, it was actually a podcast about, he, he does meditation and so do I. So I listened to, and, but he got on the subject of uh, when he goes out to an audience and this, I found this bizarre. He, he looks at it like a battle. Like if he doesn't get the laugh within the first five minutes or I can't remember the number, maybe it was five seconds. Right. He's lost the battle. It's just interesting how that's how he thinks about comedy. But I think there's analogies to comedy and how comedians interact with an audience, the way businesses interact with a marketplace. Yeah. Oh, we could, we'll do another episode. About we'll do another episode. We're going to, the people are going to, they'll create a new place. It'll be a no Facebook. <laughs> they'll, <laughs> they'll leave us soon because we're digressing, but uh, hopefully this was useful. No, this has been awesome. And that's, that's the point of the show is just to have conversations. And I, I want to take just a minute, David, and thank you for all the, all the time and like patience and education and wisdom that you've shared with me. And then also for getting me into this podcasting world, because that's, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for my first attempt that you helped me do a few years ago, my first round that was fun and came out. Okay. And then my second round was a little bit better. And this time I actually figured out what I'm supposed to do. No, Mike, I, I admire the depth to which you've committed yourself to podcasting and uh, you've discovered the power of it, which is so, so cool. There's so many levels of oh, uh, yeah. power and you've discovered them and now I'm learning from you. So it's beautiful. Thank you for having me too. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for being on. If you guys want to launch a podcast, uh, do an audio book, get on uh, David's you know radio network that he's building. Um, he's just doing really amazing things and he is one of the best experts in the industry when it comes to audio and podcasts and all these things. Um, I definitely recommend you guys check him out. I'll tag him here a little bit later, drop any comments you have. Um, and you can also go to podcast and radio.com to learn all about him and what he does there and contact him there. Um, but thank you so much for being on David. This was a blast. Again, thanks for having me. My privilege. You've been listening to today's business leaders with Gabe Arnold. Remember to subscribe on iTunes. For more information, visit todaysbusinessleaders.com.